This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. And welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you as always on every Tuesday and Thursday. And of course, whenever breaking news happens and Look, you know, right now we're in a moment where it's it's starting to pick up. There's no question about it. We are entering into campaign season 2022, and it's been it's been an interesting journey, right? Certainly, a lot of candidates rolling out their you know their desire to be included in the conversation over the last several months, even as far back as a year ago. I think the first person who officially announced, certainly in the gubernatorial race, was Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz, who announced this year as a Democrat. Um, he ran in 2018, of course, as an independent. He got like 1.3% of the vote. And over the last several months, we've seen more and more candidates rolling themselves out, both in, in the gubernatorial race and now in the congressional race with the announcement in January that Congressman Jim Langevin won't be returning to Washington, D.C., vacating that seat. And look, we've got a zillion people who have entered into that conversation Um almost to the point where it's it's somewhat unmanageable, right, for the average voter. At the same time, we've kind of quickly started to see who's going to rise to be particularly competitive. So I think as we start to frame the congressional race, it's important to, you know, I, I hate gatekeeping. I hate being a person who excludes anybody, and we're certainly not going to do that. Everyone is welcome here in Bartholomew Town, and we will certainly have um, over the course of the next several months, I think every candidate, no matter if they're an independent or Republican or Democrat or whatever it may be. Um, but at the same time, when we're formulating a conversation around what this election year looks like, I think it's it's appropriate to start to look at front runners and, and assess it from that angle, if that makes sense. But I wanted to um, I wanted to do this episode today just to sort of set the table, right? Because over the last few months, we've been dipping in and out of conversations with with candidates. We've certainly had Helena Folks on. We've had uh, just, who's a gubernatorial candidate. We've had uh, Seth Magaziner, congressional candidate on. We've had lieutenant gubernatorial candidates like Cynthia Mendez and Deb Ruggiero on. And as I look at the calendar, you know, here in, in May, we are basically entering into the point where the general public outside of the inside baseball in terms of Rhode Island politics are going to start to be paying attention more and more. And I've, I've noted this before, and it's kind of obvious at a certain level, but I think it's also important to reiterate that here in Rhode Island, we have this, this very specific election season, which entails our primaries take place in September. It's September 13th this year, the the Republican and Democrat primaries. And, that comes right after a period of time here where we are savoring as much space and free time and energy and disengagement from politics and news and so on and so forth as possible in our summertime, right? So especially in July and August, I don't know about you, but I mean, the, the old saying, you can fire a cannon in the state house in July and August and no one would hear it. It, it. It's true for elections as well. Now, that's not to say the candidates won't be out there. I mean, you'll see them, whether it's outside of some stop and shop or it's some festival or knocking on your door, they'll certainly be out there. But the, the consciousness during July and August dips down considerably. So this right now, this sprint in May and June really sets the table, really sets up our perception of candidates and where things stand before this kind of weird pause for like eight weeks, semi-pause ahead of a, of a mad dash to the primary in September 13th. So it's like after Labor Day until the primary itself, that'll be full on. And certainly here on Bartholomew Town, I probably will have an episode every single day at that point, whether it's interviews with candidates or analysis, whatever it may be. And, you know, looking at that reality, I think it's important to kind of shift gears right now here on B-Town a little bit and start to ramp things up in terms of our focus on the elections that are coming up. And we've, we've had a great year so far, and, and, and it's been a pleasure to spend time with you. And I appreciate everybody who's listened, your feedback, sending me emails, bill at ripodcast.com, whatever it may be. And we've spent a lot of time looking at innovation, spent a lot of time looking at the arts. We certainly have our monthly series, Inside Rhode Island Cannabis, presented by Pure Vita Labs, Inside Rhode Island Public Health, presented by Commonwealth Care Alliance. Um, 
we've had some interesting conversations, but and it's it's also not to say that we won't continue to have some of those conversations, but we're shifting gears. It is election time. It's time to focus on our bread and butter here. And I wanted to do this episode today just sort of, um, again, to set the table and sort of invite all of you out there to send me an email, again, bill at ripodcast.com, or you can tweet at me at Bill Bartholomew with your thoughts, things that you'd like to hear from candidates this year. I want to include you as much as possible in this because the reality is that you know, I have my pers- perspective and I have my thoughts on on what's going on here. And, and, you know, there's no way that one person or one news organization or anything like that can really have the pulse of the people. I mean, let's be honest about it. Anybody tells you that is completely absurd. So you have issues that are highly specific to you. And if you want to raise those with any candidate at the gubernatorial level, at the at, in the congressional race, um, even in, in, in your local councils, things like that, email me and I'm going to pass them on. This is something we did during during COVID that was really successful where, you know, I was at these briefings with a governor every single day and it was productive to have your feedback and your your questions. And oftentimes one, two, three, four, five people had a similar question that I was able to formulate and, and get an answer to on a specific level. And a lot of times they're things that I wouldn't think of so I, I encourage your participation as we enter into candidate season this year, and I, I really want to hear from you. So if there's something you want to hear from from your candidates um, and in any party, um, send me an email, and I'm going to try to formulate the the and facilitate those questions in the upcoming interviews that I have scheduled. So next week on the pod, I'm actually going to be doing three episodes next week. We're going to hear from a couple of major candidates. Um, as well as Dr. McDonald of the Rhode Island Department of Health. And I got questions for Dr. McDonald about where things stand with COVID-19, specifically in Rhode Island, and what, what role is it playing inside the Department of Health, right? The Department of Health does a whole lot more than just manage COVID, but it seems like over the last couple of years, we've almost forgotten that. And I wonder what's going on inside the Department of Health. So we'll have Dr. McDonald on next week. If you have a question on that, also feel free to send me a message, but you know, a big day yesterday in Rhode Island politics, and there's going to be criticism of of everybody who enters into this race. I think. I mean, there, there, we haven't had a candidate that is universally beloved. <laughs> you know what I mean? Have we ever? But but certainly this year. But yesterday at um, the Varnum Armory in East Greenwich, Alan Fung announcing that he is entering into the congressional race as a Republican. And certainly, this is no secret. He announced that, you know, the whole I'm back campaign that he launched in the wintertime. But he formulated it yesterday. And what I found really fascinating about about Fung's announcement yesterday, well, a couple of things. Number one, he didn't dismiss the notion that he was, you know, going to be a, a vessel, if you will, for Trump supporters, Okay, and that's something that has dogged Alan Fung ever since he showed up at the Trump inauguration. For some reason, he was wearing a, a Donald Trump hat, you know, a beanie. And that has been, that photo on a national level, on a local level, has been used to try to, to, to pin Alan Fung down as, you know, this, this Trump extremist. At the same time, his own model, he wears a purple tie as if to suggest he's some kind of moderate, you know, the blue and the red amalgamation and he's really calling for bipartisanship. And yesterday at his announcement, he had a lot of Democratic, um, local Democratic support surrounding him. And he, just, just in terms of flavor. And I wonder if, if he will try to pick off more and more of the conservative Democrats in the state and try to position himself as more and more of a moderate. Now, of course, you got Bob Lancia also in, in the, the Republican um, primary for 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 the congressional race, I think he's going to be a non-factor. Unfortunately, in terms of for for him and his people, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's 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 Fung's race, and the question is, I think they're already starting to look very much so look to November. Um, yesterday, General Treasurer and Congressional Candidate Seth Magaziner rolled out a website factsaboutfung dot com. And they're already looking past the primary. But don't sleep on some of the other candidates. Certainly David Siegel is making waves. He's more of a progressive voice. 
um, has a lot of out of state donations coming in, but he is somebody who is is definitely going to be a factor in this in this process. Also, Joy Fox, who will join me next week here on Bartholomew Town, another Democrat who is going to be making waves, I think, significantly in in that congressional race. So it's going to be interesting to follow. Does Fung have the ability to appeal to a centrist, uh, moderate type of audience, or is he going to continue through the pressures of his opponents and the Democrat, the Democratic Party on a national level, continue to be pushed into, you know, the, the the box of being a Trump Republican? And if so, how does that translate in November? Meanwhile, in the Democratic primary, I think it comes down to Fox Siegel. And Magaziner, with Magaziner probably being the front runner right now, but it's going to be important to watch that play out and specific questions on, you know, the litmus test of how progressive are you? I think that is really on a statewide basis, not necessarily inside the party, but when we get to November, the question of very specific issues on public safety, um, very specific issues that are environmental oriented, I think you'll see those questions and answers inside the Democratic primary play into what the actual result will be in November. So we're we're looking forward to that. Obviously, on the gubernatorial side, you've got a number of candidates. On the Republican side, you've got Ashley Kalis as well as Ray Herrera. But Kalis, certainly the front runner. She's the, you know, uh, I don't even know what to call her. She, you know, she's out of state, moved to Newport last year, opened up vaccination and testing clinics. And there was a bit of a brouhaha, some kind of bizarre incident where, you know, sources at the health department tell me that there was some mismanagement going on with her operation, distributing vaccines and tests, and her contract was not renewed. She ended up getting into a weird thing where she refused to leave the site in Westerly where she was conducting testing and vaccinations when they when the health department was trying to move in a new company to take that over the police had to be called i mean it was just a bizarre scene does that impact her candidacy i'm not sure um she she's going out of her way right now to try to suggest that she's got a movement behind her and that she's sort of an outsider candidate and when she first announced it seemed like i mean there's no chance that she would get any momentum i'm not sure she'll get a tremendous amount of momentum even now but keep an eye on Ashley Kalis to see how she plays out. Do the Republicans actually have a legitimate challenger this year? But inside the Democratic primary, Governor McKee, pretty well positioned for reelection, but certainly facing a number of challenges, especially now as we enter into campaign season and candidates start to buy television time, radio time, and other media time and build their name recognition. Helena Bonanno folks, the former CVS executive who is, you know, a lot of people say Gina 2.0. Will she make an impact in this race? Will she put pressure on Dan McKee? What about Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea? I don't think she has the statewide name recognition that um, her office alone will be able to carry her to some kind of victory. But I, I do think that from an, a personality standpoint, if she can get out in front of people, I think she could make waves as well. You got Matt Brown. He's the the progressive candidate. I'm not sure he'll be able to crack, you know, 10, 15 percent in that primary, considering how crowded it is. Dr. Munoz, also a bit of an outsider candidate, sort of a libertarian progressive. Be interesting to see how things play out on his side. Then you got the independent, Paul Rihanna. You know him? He's the guy who is out there. Um, you know, he's he, he's uh, protesting outside of Sam Bell's house. He's the guy who is describes himself as um you know, a freedom fighter because he was a CNA that lost his job when the vaccine mandate for healthcare workers came through. So that's all there, something to watch. And we'll be covering all this again, the big names, the not so big names. It's important to focus in. And, and let's be honest, it's important to analyze the, the race as a whole and minimize gatekeeping just as a practice. Uh, the lieutenant gubernatorial race is pretty interesting. You've got the incumbent Sabina Matos, who last week in a, in a pretty powerful announcement. Um, you know, she she wasn't elected, she was appointed, but now she's seeking to remain as lieutenant governor. She's going to be challenged by Deb Ruggiero, state representative Deb Ruggiero, as well as the progressive senator Cynthia Mendez. That's on the Democrat side. On the Republican side, you've got Jean Lugo, a Providence police officer who lives in Warwick, and Paul Pence, two Republicans that'll be going at it. Again, I I, I don't see a Republican having any shot 
in that race, but it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, James Diosa running for treasurer, the former Central Falls mayor. You've got Greg Amore, the representative. He's running for secretary of state. They seem to have paths that are wide open, and it's hard to imagine them not being successful. So all that's going on. Um, but 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 the point of this this podcast that's that's kind of just a a rant or something like that. I don't even know what what this really would be described as. Is just to sort of set up the notion that we're going in, that we're entering into political season, and we're making a shift here on the pod. And I want your input. So if you have a question for any of these people, I'm opening it up to you. And I want your engagement in this. And I think that the candidates, although I have plenty to ask them and will continue to do so, I have, I have a lot of perspective to, to, to share and a lot of interest in, you know, um, asking outside of the box questions that aren't necessarily the same things that they're getting everywhere else. I think, you, I think the general public needs to be more involved in vetting candidates and determining who is best positioned to be an ambassador for the people, right? That, that, that's what it comes down to. Who is best positioned to be an ambassador for the people of the state of Rhode Island, whether it's at, in the executive context in terms of the governor or if it's in the, the legislative context in terms of the congressional race. And look, look, there's a lot of races going on. There's interesting things happening on the Providence City Council, even some school committees. But all eyes are going to be on the, the governor's race and on the congressional race, and we are certainly going to cover it in great t- detail here on Bartholomew Town. So um, I hope, hopefully everyone has a spectacular day. I just wanted to break in here and kind of set the table for that. Remember, we're your podcast of record here in Rhode Island and election headquarters, B-Town, every Tuesday and Thursday and whenever breaking news happens, plus every Saturday at 3 p.m. on WPRO. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.